Do you believe in miracles? No? Well, have you ever experienced a strange occurrence or an improbable event in your life that couldn't be explained away by coincidence or mere chance? Were you left with a feeling that some inexplicable force was at work? Or that some higher, even divine power had taken a hand in your destiny? Well, if you have, you are not alone. If you haven't, watch and listen closely. The lives of a happy young couple, Robert Shea and Janet Boole, were shattered by a terrible tragedy. In life, Robert's devotion to his wife and son brought loving, total security. And in death, it brought the astonishing and, yes, miraculous message from beyond. For long-distance truck driver, Barney Mays, what began as an unexplained call for help on his CB radio would soon turn into an unexpected blessing. And amazingly, 12 years later, would become an astonishing, life-saving miracle. Hard-working rancher Virgil Maxwell, usually accustomed to a good night's sleep, was suddenly awakened at 3.30 a.m. on a wintry Arizona night. He had experienced a dream so real it startled him awake and put him on the trail of an unexpected rescue. News stories and investigations from across the country and around the world continue to bring reports of miraculous events, often at religious sites and shrines. Thousands tell of witnessing holy and bleeding statues. There are even stories of miracle healings and instantaneous cures. Are these reports all hoaxes, delusions, or could they be the real thing? I'm Darren McGavin, and for the next hour, join me for a look at some true stories and documented cases beyond imagination. Stories of strange events and fateful encounters. You'll see how the lives and destinies of ordinary people like you and me have been changed forever by miracles and other wonders. If love is the strongest emotional bond between two people, then when a man and a woman find a rare, true love, sometimes incredible things can happen. Like the story of Robert Shea and Janet Rule, and a love that transcended life itself. Everyone in Leesboro were charmed by the young lovers, and when they graduated, they were John Marshall High School's own special homegrown Romeo and Juliet. For someone who is skeptical, I can say, I can tell you my story. For me, it was true because it happened. That doesn't make any sense. Yes, it does look. I love you for ever. See? That's sweet. Thank you. They were married, and their precious son, Ted, was born the following year. You know, I just want you to know that I will never let you and Teddy down. I'll always love and protect you, no matter what. Almost from the moment he was born, there was an incredible bonding between Robert and Ted. Could have ever imagined how close. Robert's steady efforts and loyalties earned promotions and raises at a local lumberyard. But for him, that wasn't enough. 
He took specialized college courses and worked night after night at home perfecting his craft. He desperately wanted to be a commercial artist. Several times each year, Robert would travel to New York City. There, he would make the rounds of advertising agencies and design for them, showing them and hoping for his big name. Robert was always looking for a way to ensure that Janet and Ted would never want for anything, and perhaps fate stepped into his plans in that spring. Some of Robert's designs had caught the eye of a major company and brought the opportunity for an interview in New York. The job meant a quantum leap for Robert to move close to his sworn goal. Welcome aboard, Robert. Thank you very much, Mr. Wilson. I hope you have a long and rewarding association with us. Well, I'm sure that I will. Take care. Yeah, you too. Whatever well, else happened, sure. Janet and Ted would now have financial security. Janet, honey, I got the job. It's finally happening. By the way, I'll tell the birthday boy Daddy's coming home for his party right now. I'm leaving the airport as soon as I hang up. All right, I'll see you in 40 minutes. I love you. Bye. At that moment, with a new job in hand, Robert Shea considered himself the happiest and luckiest man alive. But who can ever know when fortune will suddenly change? <laughs> with neither malice nor forethought, with only sadness and tragedy, a life was snatched from a loving and devoted husband and an irreplaceable young The trauma of Robert's death left Janet devastated. But overlooking Ted's needs would only make things worse. It's been almost two months now, Janet. You've got to take hold, no matter how it hurts. My little boy needs you. I know, Dad. I just miss Robert so much. There was more than 6,000 in the bank after Robert's final check. Now we're down to 1,200. I don't know what I'm going to do. Day by day, almost hour by hour, Janet willed herself back to life and its harsh realities. I'm not going to make payments on the house. I'm going to lose it. Robert. I need you. I need you so much. Then, at the very bottom of her grief and loss, the forces of the miracle began gathering. Daddy. Daddy 
It is most important to remember that Ted was only four years old, that he had never been to school and could not read or write a single letter of the alphabet. What Ted had written bore a strong resemblance to the shorthand taught by Robert by his college buddy, Jack Knowles. This is the shorthand that Robert and I used in school. But it doesn't seem to mean anything. It's, it's just letters and these numbers, you know? How is that possible? I don't know. Um... Then, as Jack put the first letters and numbers up on the board, Janet could hardly believe what she saw. It's Robert. In my yearbook. Don't you remember? That's what he wrote to me. I love you forever. And now there's a two. He means me and Teddy. Look at the rest. Jack Knowles translated the remainder of the shorthand symbols into a puzzling series of letters and numbers. Could BX mean box? Box 1142. Did Robert have a post office box? No. 34 ST. Could be street. But there isn't a 34th street in town. What about BK? Bank, maybe? What about MD and TN? Maryland? Tennessee? 34th street. What was that movie about 34th street? Miracle on 34th street. That's in New York. Jack immediately checked the business directory for New York. Look at this. There's a Midtown Bank on 34th Street in Manhattan. Safety deposit. Box 1142. Jack Knowles put a call into the bank, but they would not release depositor information over the phone. The family all agreed to come up with the money for Janet to make the trip to New York. Would you verify that this is your husband's signature, please? There was no doubt yes, the signature on the it. bank papers right, was Robert's. Come around this way. The safety deposit box had been rented during one of Robert's early trips to New York. Uh, would you like to step into this room? Thank you. There were bills in the box, and Janet's heart skipped a little. $925. It would take half that just to pay for the trip to New York. She was about to close the box when she saw the folded paper in the bottom. It was an insurance policy that Robert had taken out during an earlier trip to New York. It was a $100,000 policy with a double indemnity clause for accidental death. Teddy and I were at the end of our rope, and hope as well. I know, and God does too, that Robert's love and his promise, in some miraculous way, came across from the beyond to save us. Love is such a tie, such a such an important ingredient between people that it can reach across the barrier of life and death. While across the continent at a private airport in New Mexico, the hand of fate had already reached out and touched the lives of Gerald and Nelda Kelly. One of our commercial pilots, a fellow named Jerry, good friend of mine, uh, told me a story about uh, a very strange incident. He and uh, his wife Nelda had rented this little single engine Cessna, and they were uh, taxing out on the field for takeoff, and suddenly his uh, eyeglasses fogged up so badly that he couldn't see. And uh, so he took them off, handed them to his wife, and said, here, honey, clean these up for me. She did, handed them back to him, and almost immediately they fogged up a second time. 
so uh, Jerry then felt like there was really something amiss, something wrong. So he said, look, hon, uh, I don't know what it is, but he said, uh, let's, let's just turn this plane around. He turned his plane around on the field, on the taxi ramp there, and almost immediately the engine quit. They opened up the engine cowling, checked it out, and found a clogged fuel valve that surely would have prevented them from uh, safely and successfully taking off and probably would have ended their lives. The thing of it was that Jerry was just certain that some outside supernatural force, whatever, had warned him to not take off and uh, had therefore saved uh, his and his wife's life. Coming next, 12 years after he intercepted a puzzling radio message, one man's charitable deed beyond all probability was miraculously repaid. Drivers of those big rigs spend long and stressful hours in those tall cabs. Oftentimes with only a citizen fan radio, the familiar CB. Most often, especially on long hauls, the CB is their one lone and constant companion, their link to the world rolling by outside. And in this particular instance, a mysterious call on a CB radio opened the door to an incredible miracle. Yeah, if you go through there the way we used to, Smokey's gonna get you and keep you. Barney Mays was a depression kid who never forgot being poor. He swore his family would never have to know that kind of misery. But spending 20 days out of every month on the road was turning him into a stranger at home. Leonard, what's the story? You gonna get that backyard picked up anytime soon? Hey, you don't rebuild an engine overnight. Give me a break. What? My homework's done. No, I didn't say anything. What did I say? Hey, Kirsten. Come around and give your daddy a big hug. security, Barney was on the verge of losing something much more precious, his family. The road had become his life, but something extraordinary was about to send an incredible shockwave into his world. Like most truckers, Barney kept the CB on all the time for company. Bruce, beat me to a little coffee and kill you there. Yeah, I'll meet you there, you bud. Then, without warning, the CB radio went completely dead. No incoming signal could be heard on any channel. That night, Barney was pushing a bonus load, extra money for beating the schedule. Then, when he was about 150 miles down the road, the first of the night's strange events came without warning. Help me. Someone, please. Anybody out there? Anybody out there hearing this distress call? This guy sounds like he's got big trouble. Come on back. When he kept trying, he didn't get any response. Heart attack, car damage. I can't last much longer. I need help badly. What's your 20, man? When the heck are you? You better come on back. County Road 26. About 10 miles north of Okay, I'm on my way. If Barney could have passed the distress call to a closer driver, he would have kept on going down the road. Oh, my boss. The next 40 minutes were the longest in Barney's life. Yeah. 
files in my bag. I gotta get you some real professional help. Now don't move. Be still. Anybody monitoring Channel 19? I got an emergency. I got a driver on County Road 26 with a heart attack. I need help. Barney could only hope that his call was being heard somewhere out there in the cold, dark night. Copy. This is Pike County Sheriff Deputy Orwell. I'm calling for the paramedics. Barney explained the unusual call that he had received on the CB and of how he had backtracked and found the victim. You trying to jerk my chain or what, man? So what are you talking about? There's no CB in that car. Barney returned home and told his family about what had happened. The odd events of that night were soon to have a profound effect on Barney and his family. I get a feeling that something very special happened. Yeah, that's really a great job, son. You did a good job. Thanks, Dad. The brush with death gave him a new sense of his own mortality and of the things that were truly important. He started to spend less time on the road. The family became the center of his attention and life took on a new meaning. But that was not the end. There was an even more astonishing chapter yet to be written. A dozen years later, Barney and Cicely retired, and Barney was able to catch up on some of the things he'd missed out on along the way. Like fishing with a good friend, Ed DeSalvo. Uh, Mike. Last time I talked to him, he said he'd meet us down by the string. Oh, you think maybe he's down there burying the king of wood in the woods? <laughs> Hey, Particularly, Barney came to love the fine trout streams of the White Mountain Apache Reservations. On the New Mexico border, it is some of the wildest and most beautiful country in the entire Southwest. Hey, Mike! Man, where are you taking us? We've been hiking for hours. You always say, Mike, take us someplace nobody has ever been before. This time, I'm taking you. Yeah. Well, we can see why nobody's ever been there before. Hey, fellas? What's the matter, Barney? You look up. I'm, all of a sudden, I'm having these pains in my neck, my chest, and in my arms. Take it easy. You'll be fine. We'll take Mike care of Mike Greyhawk was an experienced guide who quickly recognized the signs of a possible heart attack. There's a reservation nearby. There's the guide quickly explained that they were going to have to get Barney to a reservation village about a mile due east. But there was something that Mike did not tell them. The reservation's medical facility was served by a traveling nurse who only visited this area once a month. How much farther, Mike? Marty about had it. The presence of the motorhome meant that the visiting nurse luckily was in the village. Mercedes Conway was a skilled nurse practitioner. The very low blood pressure and irregular heart rhythm told her that Barney had suffered a myocardial infarction, a condition beyond her expertise. Is he gonna make it? His condition's very serious. But Mr. Mays is far luckier than you could hope for. What do you mean? There's no time to explain right now. I'll be right back. Mercedes' father was a cardiologist residing in Texas. The doctor had just retired, and this was the first opportunity he had to break away from his busy practice and visit his daughter during her service on the reservation. Hey, right with me. Keep your eye on that monitor. Barney's condition was grave, and even with the help of a specialist, it was going to be close. Charge. When I get him, here we go again. Clear. If he's coming back up. If Dr. Ehrlich had not been there, Barney Mays would have died. 
That would have been miracle enough for any story. But even as the medevac helicopter was on its way that morning to lift Barney to a hospital, there was an even more incredible climax unfolding. When Dr. Ehrlich stopped in to check on his emergency patient, it was the first opportunity Barney had to see the doctor face to face. How do you feel this morning? Dr. Ehrlich was the very same man whose life Barney had saved on that wintry night 12 years before. In the wondrous ways that surround our existence, the drama had come full circle. Because Barney Mays answered that plaintive cry for help on his CB that night, he had literally and miraculously saved his own life. When we return, do our dreams predict the future? Can they help us see another time and place? For Arizona resident Virgil Maxwell, a startling dream was an unexpected invitation to an amazing, miraculous rescue. Miracles and other wonders will return in a moment. To most people around the world, the American supermarket is the true miracle. The selection of meats, produce, and dairy foods is a wonder of abundance and plenty. But it is a miracle that starts with the people who work the farms and the ranches across our great land. Uh, we had always stayed in touch with Virgil, and if nothing else, at least show him our gratitude and, and the way we really felt about him, and the fact that we thought he was a very great man. Obviously, I'll, I'll remember him until I die. Virgil Maxwell of Membrino County, Arizona, carried on the simple and honest tradition shared by people who work the land. A tradition that remains unchanged to this day. Help thy neighbor. There's still maybe about a half a dozen cows right up there in that chaparral. About three or four calves with them. Get us a big snow tonight and lose them calves. Well, I might be able to find them still. Now, you run this bunch on down, get your supper, I'll run it. Virgil's friends and neighbors would hardly be surprised that he received yet another call for help. But no one on earth could have guessed its strange origin or the miraculous means by which he would receive it. If I ain't come to church again... And aren't I ashamed making excuses to Pastor Maddox? Church wouldn't do you no harm, Virgil Maxwell. Her old mayor wasn't right on her time. I'd be there right alongside both of you. In Prescott, many miles away, the second half of the Membrino County Miracle was just beginning. Dennis Hargis! Dennis! It was the exact same dream you had before? Yeah, twice, just the same. Hey, I think I hear him. That's it. There's nobody out there. For adventurous nine-year-old Dennis Hargis, waiting for the ride to take him to camp was pure agony. And you're right in your own room and bed, but you're covered all over with snow? Yeah, and this big man on a horse kept calling my name, but I couldn't move. Hey, that's him. I gotta go. What? But neither his father nor mother could shake off the uneasy feeling over their son's upcoming trip. Ordinarily, camping groups arriving at the church facility would have been given a camp familiarization lecture. But the counselor wanted to get the boys settled in first. The high country of Membrino County was known for sudden and violent weather changes. In this part of northern Arizona, heavy snowfall was not unusual as late as the middle of May. Yeah, storm's gonna be a beaut. Virgil and his son often worked long hours together on the ranch, just as Virgil had as a boy with his own father. Another close father and son were Sheriff Bob Carr and his boy Jerry. As with Maxwell's son, Jerry enjoyed working with his dad. Hi, son. Oh, it's freezing out there. I know. How's school today? It's pretty good. 
On that March 4th afternoon, the temperature began dropping rapidly. The storm was already moving in. Hey, check it out. It's snowing. Man, you can't even see the trees anymore. Oh, no. I left my wall in the van. I gotta go get it. Well, you better put a park on. It's cold out there. I'm just going over to the van and back. What started out as a short walk across the compound suddenly turned into a trek of nightmarish proportions. Within moments, nine-year-old Dennis Hargis, already unfamiliar with the layout of the campground, became hopelessly disoriented. All the immediate landmarks were hidden under a blanket of white powder and further obscured by the constantly falling snow. Soon, the youngster took a wrong turn and wandered out of the campground. Dennis continued to plunge on, expecting any time to find the recreation hall or one of the cabins. The first call came in from the camp counselor shortly after three. By this time, Dennis Hargis had already been missing almost two hours. Mr. Moore, calm down, sir. Okay, don't do a thing. Sit right down with the boys. Don't track up the area. I'm on my way. We've got us a lost little boy up at Firebird Camp. Son, I've got to depend on you. Get on the radio. Deputies, medevac, search and rescue. Can you handle it? Yeah, Dad, don't worry. I can handle it. Let's get your people this squadron over here. Get your... Go ahead. By now, more than 100 people had been alerted and had joined the search. The search for Dennis Hargis, the little boy who disappeared from the YMCA church camp near Mount Solterra, will soon be hampered by darkness. The searchers, who now number more than 100, are spread out in a widening circle over an area of several miles. But a major problem is that intense snow flurries earlier today quickly covered any tracks, making it difficult to pick up little Dennis's trail. However, a break in the storm has allowed search and rescue crews, now aided by dogs and helicopters, to intensify their efforts in hope of finding Dennis before darkness settles in these rugged mountains. The boy had covered an incredible six miles before coming to an old rift fence. Young Dennis was afraid his continued wandering would only take him farther and farther from safety. Cold and exhausted, he rigged up a crude shelter and climbed inside. Now, with only the flimsiest of protection and another storm moving in, he fell into a deep and weary sleep. His only company was fear and the relentless cold. Soon the searchers numbered more than 200 and involved some 12 different state, county and volunteer agencies. The media coverage had become national and people across the nation were praying that the lost little boy would be found. Although they searched all day, the boy was not found. To complicate the search even more, weather reports called for another new heavy storm again that night. Rancher Virgil Maxwell tucked in his son for the night and couldn't keep from thinking about another man, the father of the missing boy, whom he knew must be in sheer agony over the uncertain fate of his own son. That little fella's been out in the cold 28 hours already. But tonight's gonna dip down 10, 12 degrees. He ain't never gonna make it. My heart goes out to him too, honey. They got all those folks out looking for him. There's nothing more we can do about it. You just come on to bed now. But incredibly, though Virgil had never laid eyes on Dennis or his parents, that force that moves in such wondrous ways was already at work. <sighs> what? Jenny, I, I know where that boy is. I just dreamed it, clear as day. That piece of old drift fence, up along the south boundary of the government range. I gotta go get it. 
Neither Virgil nor his wife or son questioned the need for them to go out in the bitter cold at 3.30 in the morning to look for the lost boy that Virgil had seen only in a dream. Should have come across that fence line by now. Everything's all drifted over. You all right? I'm a little cold, I guess. Last time you listened to one of the old man's dreams, I bet. Regardless of how their quest might turn out, Virgil found himself proud of his son's commitment to the stranger who needed help. We gotta keep looking. I can get him, Pa. Get him, son. Be careful. That frozen son freaked out, horse. What in heaven's name am I doing out here? Frustrated, tired, and full of doubt, Virgil nonetheless pushed forward, driven, impelled by the powerful vision of his unexpected dream. Nice. wonder what, what would I have done without this guy coming and finding me. While we're driving back, there's the radio, there's a guy, they have a radio in the vehicle, and they're, they're calling across the radio and saying, we, we found him, we found him. I felt like I was chosen, almost chosen to live, rather than to stay the extra 10 hours out there and to have died. There is nothing in rational thought that can explain Dennis Hargis' earlier recurring dream or the startling vision that interrupted Virgil Maxwell's sleep. When considering these imponderable mysteries, we are only left to find the answer in the realm of the unexplained, or more probably, as we've seen here, in the Kingdom of Miracles. The most dramatic and controversial types of reported miracles are often associated with religious sites, churches, and shrines. Thousands of people have told of seeing visions and witnessing weeping or bleeding religious artifacts. Now, to the skeptic, it's easy to dismiss these stories as products of the imagination of the over-enthusiastic believers. But the fact is, reports of this sort are far more common and widespread than most people realize. And news coverage of these events is not confined to reports in the tabloid press. What you see represents only a handful of these stories published by the Chicago Tribune, the Los Angeles Times, the Palm Beach Post, Tucson Daily Citizen, and the Chicago Sun-Times, just to mention a few. As word went out that we were preparing this program of miracles and other wonders, we began to receive from home viewers like yourselves photographs and video recordings which show an amazing variety of phenomena. The most intriguing of the material led us to a story that has been unfolding in a suburban community in Houston, Texas. By their nature, odd unexpected events spring from the most unlikely sources, even from a nearly typical Texas family. Mom runs a successful barbecue restaurant. That's about as Texas as you can get. Dad is a doctor of veterinary science and works as an inspector for the USDA. Their son is a typical young teen into baseball and basketball. Along with about 300 other families, they attend this church on Mulberry Lane in the Houston suburb of Bel Air. They are the Ayub family, husband and wife, Tharwat, the veterinary doctor, and Nahed, the barbecue entrepreneur, who immigrated to this country from Egypt 15 years ago. And 13-year-old Isaac, their ball-playing, pizza-loving, American-born son. But more than their heritage distinguishes the Ayub family, two events in recent years have rocked their lives. In 1989, a series of tests at Texas Children's Hospital in Houston revealed that Isaac had contracted a life-threatening illness, acute lymphoblastic leukemia. Under the supervision of his primary care physician, Dr. Atef Rizkala, Isaac began chemotherapy treatments. 
In December 1991, Isaac developed a severe sore throat. Dr. Rizkala immediately feared the youngster's leukemia had taken a turn for the worse. Instead, he discovered that his young cancer patient had become abruptly and unexpectedly cured. The biopsy was negative. The leukemia has completely subsided and he was leukemia free at the time. What had changed? What was different now that had brought about the sudden and apparent cure? Family, friends, and hundreds of strangers who have visited this quiet suburb believe it is this. A commonly available portrait of Jesus Christ which hangs on the bedroom wall in the Ayub family home in Houston. What's so unusual? On November 11th, 1991, this portrait, a gift from a family friend, began to weep. Not just a drop or two. The surface of the picture was virtually leaking. Oily, tear-like drops covered the front. Isaac's mother recalls the events that started it all. Isaac was sick and I left him in the bed. Uh, I went out of the room. He was laying down in my master bedroom and suddenly he was screaming. And I just happened to look at the picture and the eyes, they just started moving. And then um, the hands of the Jesus, they moved up like that. And then they went back down really fast and I, I, I was scared so I ran out of the room. After that I went back to the room, I saw Jesus' eyes moving and he started tearing. Lot of liquid. The weeping has continued now for months. There's so much liquid oozing from the portrait, a holder containing cotton batting had to be situated below the picture to absorb all the fluid. In the months since the phenomena first began, thousands of people, hundreds a day, have flocked to witness the weeping portrait. Two of my cotton balls out of several that was given to me uh, reoccurred with oil. The first time I noticed the first one doing this, I think I turned white because it, I know it had completely been dry. I had used it. I see a lot of unusual and different things in my job, as any photojournalist does. But this one kind of uh, took the cake. The Pope of the Coptic Church, the Christian sect in which the Ayubs are members, sent Bishop Tadros all examine the portrait. The picture was removed from the wall and inspected. The front of the portrait was wiped dry and they waited. Soon the tears began to flow again. Local religious authorities asked Mrs. Ayub to put it on display in St. Mark's, the church where they attended. Mrs. Ayub was reluctant. And I will ask him to leave it for me because it's a gift from God. And I ask God to give me something instead. While her reluctance may arouse a skeptic's suspicion about the authenticity of the weeping Jesus, what happened next startled even the most devout believer. Mrs. Ayub hung other portraits of Christ on the same wall as the original picture. Amazingly, after a short time, they too began to weep. And visitors who came to witness the phenomena and pray in the former bedroom that had become something of a shrine also brought portraits to place in the room. In many instances, these two duplicated the weeping. Others besides Isaac have reported miraculous healing experiences, and those witnessing these amazing events are not exclusively members of the Coptic Orthodox faith, such as Houston resident Fanny Elmore. I have a lot of faith in God, and uh, I uh, pray for my health, Usually the doctor gives me results every six weeks. She said, I cannot explain this. Uh, don't ask me why. And I said, what is it? She says, you're free of cancer. She said, you're clean. Still reluctant to move the original portrait, Mrs. Ayub, in a special ceremony, donated a second portrait to St. Mark's Church, one which hung for a time next to the original. And yes, the donated portrait on display for all to see is still weeping. What began as a very private experience for one young boy and his family has spread far beyond what anyone could have guessed. He gave me a gift nobody else had it. He cured my son and he was with me and he's still with me and he's still with a lot of people right now inside my house. And I feel this gift nobody asked more than that. Miracles and other wonders will return in a moment. What could possibly account for the weeping portrait in that suburban Houston home? An unknown phenomenon? Religious hallucinations? 
Could the cures of 13-year-old Isaac and reportedly others have some less fantastic explanation? Ultimately, you have to decide for yourself. But remember, thousands of people from Texas and across the country, millions from around the world, have seen and experienced something extraordinary with their own eyes. For them, there is no question they were a witness to a true miracle. Of human fate and destiny, Albert Einstein wrote, he who can no longer pause to wonder and stand wrapped in awe is as good as dead, his eyes are closed. I'm Darren McGavin. Thank you for joining us in this special presentation of Miracles and Other Wonders.